I was a vegetarian for 11 years and I've been a vegan for about a year now. And before that, I ate meat and I actually enjoyed some of it. That wasn't until I began asking what it was I was eating and where it came from. I ended up slowly transitioning to a more plant-based diet in high school. And by the time I entered college, I was fully vegetarian. I wanted to know more about what eating meat does to our environment and how it affects our ecosystem. And I started to ask more questions like, was it better to give it all up or are my intentions to save the planet off or not? Hello, and welcome to the Jazz About Nature podcast, the show where I talk about all things related to nature and the environment. Today, I decided to sit down and have a conversation with photographer Jenna Galindo of Jenna Galindo Photography, who has prior experience with the dairy industry. So, you were a pescatarian before. I wanted, Five months. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about your brief history with pescatarianism and whether or not you remember why you chose to cut out all meat except for fish. Okay, so actually, uh, I'm a really bad pescatarian. <laughs> <laughs> There's no I, bad pescatarians. <laughs> and I'll get into that I, later. I, I stuck to it, and I only ate fish as a as a meat protein. I didn't have any chicken or beef or pork or anything like that. So in that regard, I did well. But I actually got into being a pescatarian for five months. One of those was during Thanksgiving. That was a fun topic with family. <laughs> Because people have a hard time, I think, dietary needs. And I think that kind of happens now with veganism. And I actually got into being a pescatarian, I think, for the same reason many people are getting into veganism. If they don't have a hardcore reason to become a vegan, they, I think, are looking for a healthier diet. And I know a few people who actually have become vegans strictly to lose weight and to keep the weight off. That was actually why I became a pescatarian. So not the greatest reasons, maybe, but it was my reasons for the time and I was really horrible at it because you know I should have had more veggies and fruit did have fish but yeah I had a lot of fries and chips you know and like and junk food and it's funny because that's not typically the diet that happens when people first become vegetarian they don't Mm -hmm. know what to eat they're not really familiar with other foods and so they start off with potatoes french fries they're vegetarian it's not me Mm -hmm. like rather than getting the burger i'll just get the fries and it's fries for however many months until they get sick of it and then they stop (laughs) becoming vegetarian and i think knowing what you're getting into at the beginning really is helpful to you know plan what you're going to eat where like what you would order at your favorite fast food restaurants ahead of time so when you get there you're not going straight for the potatoes for the fries no absolutely i would even go to restaurants and just like eat the most awful thing with like fish or just no fish but it was just still awful or i'd have a plate of fries i think people who are becoming vegan now are much more health conscious than i was i was trying to lose weight and just thinking if i cut out other beefs and chickens and porks that i will be forced to eat better (laughs) (laughs) and at the time i was i was kind of tired of it actually i was kind of tired of regular meats i didn't eat a lot of fish in my diet but i thought if i do feel like fish then that's a great way to incorporate some protein a little more easily here because I wasn't very educated. Like right now, I probably get most of my protein from peanut butter. (laughs) (laughs) Love peanut butter. And there's an an eggs. And I love those those two. Those are probably my favorite types of protein. So back then, this was, oh God, how many years ago? At least five. Wow. Yeah. And Oh, no, I think longer. Yeah, it's been a while. I think longer. Do you remember why you started eating meat again? I think I just really got over it. I realized that I wasn't eating better. In fact, I was eating worse because I was cutting out the good meats that I ate. I came back into this with a huge appreciation for chicken. I hated chicken before. (laughs) Now I love chicken and that's good because it actually is a much healthier meat for your body versus having like steak and beef all the time, which is what my diet was a lot of. Mm -hmm. So no, you know, shade to anybody who does it. I just, I definitely like chose my path back to to meat but and that works for me and I think I feel really good with what I eat now and I definitely eat a lot healthier than I did when I was a pescatarian. (laughs) Do you think that 
because you went pescatarian, you consciously or subconsciously started eating less meat once you went back to eating meat again? I definitely, just for the for my health reasons, definitely tried to. If I, if I ate out, which I used to a lot, I don't so much anymore. I do cook from home a lot. We try to use veggies more because just if you really look at your diet, I think a lot of people are really lacking <laughs> on veggies. And I think that's also, I don't know, I think a lot of people are going vegan partially because it is trendy right now. I, I don't think there's any denying that it is actually a trend right now people are using it almost as like a keto diet kind of thing like not this you know not that the same but the way keto is very very popular right now i think veganism is something people are taking on some people i think stay with it forever and some people go back to either just being a vegetarian or they do go back to eating meat down the road i think that a lot of people don't always sustain any kind of way of eating. I think it definitely changes with how you evolve and how your body changes sometimes. No, I mean, I think it's really cool. I think that there's a lot of vegan products that I know people really like because even people I notice who don't, they're not completely vegan. They eat vegan a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. I know it's even more interesting to talk about veganism with both of our backgrounds, actually. We both are from a really small town that is surrounded mm-hmm. by dairy cows and small... Well, not anymore. Yeah, well, dairy industry is dead, yeah. pretty much. It's, it's dying pretty but, rapidly, but... But when but we yeah, were growing up, it, it, absolutely. Was, it was everywhere. Like, every, every family had a dairy, and I personally saw, like, dairy cows on my way to school and church and wherever. It was it was mm-hmm. part of our lives. It was a big thing. And oh, yeah. To go from those I think, milk I think the ag industry is really, really thriving a few years ago yeah. and there's kind of been this condemnation i think these days there's definitely a lot of people condemning the ag industry which i think is remarkable because i mean that's where you get all of your food and clothing <laughs> pretty much there's there's no way around it and i understand that like from the outside i think people see a lot of practices uh, that ranchers and farmers do as either unnecessary or they think it's bad but you know you really have to understand an industry and understand what goes into it and it takes so much education there are people that i went to school with who grew up with as ranchers and farmers kids they they worked in the industry and here they are in college to learn more and to further their education and there is so much that goes into every aspect it's so much and and it's kind of funny because if you think about a big company you know you have people for different departments Mm -hmm. well you know farmers kind of handle it all they do the accounting on their own they do the on hand you know that they are the the hands in the dirt you know and and with the animals They, they are out there on the field they're in the office doing accounting they're talking to everybody who needs to be talked to they're making meetings in some cases they do collaborate sometimes and they do their own sales it's it's a lot and it and it's a lot of usually one or maybe a family handling a very large operation yeah And even if it's not a very large operation, I think a lot of people would think that 600 cows is a lot. It's not. It's a very, 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 very small number. There's a very large operation run usually by either one person or a family. Me and my sister would help my dad in the office, and it would usually just be that. I would do filing and very, you know, menial work just to kind of help take the clutter of everything off as I worked another job. And my sister would do the accounting and bill paying, make sure the employees' checks are written and, you know, everything, you know, just t- took care of all the financial aspects of it. And then my dad handled sales, operations, day to day. He handled everything. He was in charge of our workers. It was, it's a lot to do for what people yeah. For one or for one for one or just a few people. And I definitely get that. And I, I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about like large scale versus small scale farming. I know most people try to urge people to support their local small farmers, family base, because most of the time those practices are a lot better and more humane than the factory farming or you know and, and there's a bit of ambiguity uh, behind I, I the do word. actually disagree with that to an extent. I okay. I do support I do su- absolutely support local businesses. I really, really do. Mm-hmm. But I'm not. All, but I'm also not going to sit here and condemn the larger dairy operations that have thousands and thousands of head of cattle or cows. Excuse me. But don't you think that there's like 
a little bit of a difference between the way that they treat their cattle versus a smaller scale operation where they get to tend to the cows and see them a little bit more up close and personal in a smaller farm versus, you know, this large overgrown type of organization or operation? I personally don't, from my point of view. I do obviously support local farmers more as, frankly, I'm biased. I, you know, grew up on a small dairy. Yeah. And we hung in there much, much longer than the larger dairies did. And, you know, we have these bigger dairy farms. But the thing is, these animals are all being taken care of, whether it's a small operation or a big operation. The bigger operation, there's more of them. But instead of it being a family farm or, you know, one person managing most everything you have you have the people in charge it really is more run like a regular corporation you have more people on hand because they can afford to hire more people and that's a big difference too so you actually have both you know the large and small dairies i think taking very very good care of these cattle you have to remember this is their livelihood at the end of the day you are not going to sit there and abuse cows whether you have a small or a large dairy because that's how you make your income. You want to make sure that these cows are taken care of, that they're healthy, that they're not under stress or in pain, mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that they're not sick. But at the same time, you do have the business to run. And mm -hmm. I know that sometimes, not all farmers, definitely not all farmers, some of them, they may have to cut you know, corners or cut costs in a different way that may not be completely harmful for the animal, but it's not the best practice, i.e. feeding dairy animals like corn instead of their, you know, other feed or... Oh, corn is fine. But cows, cows, cows do very well. Well, not just strictly corn. In response to that, I think that it's very interesting that cows, I, I can speak more about cows than anything just because I have a little more experience in that field, but mm -hmm. cows are actually very resilient mm -hmm. and they do very well with a different kind of diet. Growing up, we always had several different grains we would mix in for them along with their hay. They would always have their hay. They'd always have their alfalfa, yeah. no matter what, but we would always give them grain in addition to that and it would always be a mixture there were some years where we subbed out certain grains for other things, something that was very popular a while ago and actually did pretty well with cows. Cows do actually very good on it is putting orange pe peels in, in with their food. That's really interesting though. Like, yeah, but in, in the wild, I mean, I, I don't think I've really ever seen a cow in the wild anymore because they're so domesticated. Is it? Well, they don't really do. They probably wouldn't do as well any, anymore anyway. <laughs> but like, you know, their, their diet has definitely significantly changed. And I don't know if it's because of human influence, just like how we've adapted uh, cats and dogs diets to mm -hmm. eating the factory produced kibble well, versus you you know, the meats that they would have find uh, mm -hmm. out on uh, on the side of the road or in nature or whatever. Like it, it's, it's interesting to kind of like compare the two and talk about that. And I guess it's a whole other podcast. What, it's a big what's discussion. Better for them? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we'll, so for cows, I mean, if they were just wild, first of all, you still want to want to milk and milk cows because if they lost, let's just say that they're completely wild and we're not touching them. Mm -hmm. If cow has a baby and so they have milk production with that baby, if the baby dies prematurely, the mother can actually, it won't just be that she just dries up immediately. She will probably develop milk fever mm -hmm. from not being milked or fed from. I mean, I feel like it'd be a little bit more and similar milk, to... And milk fever is something they can die from. Yeah, but if um, you I actually had a cow that died from that. Um, a show cow growing up, unfortunately. But, anyway, sorry. Well, what I was saying with that, like, you know, I guess the argument for a lot of vegans is that it's 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 all based on supply and demand. Yes, certain cows definitely need to, you know, be milked or or make sure that their calf is getting milk once they've given birth. But mm -hmm. where vegans step in is that they mention that without the demand for more milk and more dairy or more meat that we wouldn't be breeding more cows or, or cattle for agricultural reasons 
where I, I, I definitely see both sides that yes, on the one hand, there's, you know, these group of people who've been dairy farming their entire lives and that, you know, this is their livelihood. This is their life. This is part of their history and who they are. And then there's these other people who have come in later on in, in the game and, and talked about these animals are, are, are being possibly abused or being commercialized in such a way that it's we're, we're like hurting the planet in another way as far as like sustainability is concerned and Mm -hmm. it's definitely interesting to to talk about and hear both sides i mean i've always said i wish i was treated as well as a cow (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i I don't don't know if i really want to oh oh no we treated ours quite well (laughs) they they had had bedding and a place to lay down Um, most most cows will sleep standing up being inseminated by you know humans and like having a baby whether i wanted to or not because i'm not voicing my opinion like I definitely get that argument well they also don't think the same way that we do first of all well, but also I don't in, know, the, like, in, the, in the wild a bull will just mount a cow and so if people totally are talking about rape nature. then that would happen exact I mean I'm not it, I don't consider it rape I just don't but because yeah. because again we don't have the same kind of feeling as cows do it's, I mean, it's it, definitely it is, more a baser thing but you know people talk about insemination as rape and it's like well in the wild a bull will mount a cow she mm-hmm. can't just walk away she will she will be mounted and you know she'll be inseminated that way and you know most likely become pregnant yeah and 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 that's totally natural and it's you know what happens out in the wild and, and, but, and if anything the way we do it is probably a lot more gentle for well, them. I, I definitely know it's a lot more gentle i've seen it happen it's, it's, it's just, just tiny little thing yeah it, it is tiny well to me it looks a little bit bigger but compared to the cow it's <laughs> it's smaller than what what could be going on yes but at the same time like i don't know i, I guess personally and and that's kind of all what vegan veganism is about is just what can you stomach personally like what do you believe on a personal level as far as what like what do you think about that situation and yeah and that can be said about anything yeah Um, so if you're fine and and i and i completely respect other people's opinions and i and i get the way you can think that way because everybody has a different experience growing up not everybody knows how to take care of a cat a lot of people look at a calf and they think that it's starving because you can see its ribs milk cows are constructed differently you can see ribs on them but you have to see where the fat is you have to understand the anatomy of, of a cow the calf you can't actually overfeed a lot of people think they're starving because you can see their ribs you have to be really careful when you're feeding calf they cannot be overfed or they can die from that mm-hmm. and so you just really have to be very educated about animals all animals look different i mean you can look out in nature and be like Nature can be really weird. Animals can look really odd. I've seen animals that I'm like, that can't be right, but it is. <laughs> it's like, it looks horrible and deformed and it looks like it's sick, but that's the way the animal looks in the wild. <laughs> that's that's absolutely just how the species is. Yeah, it sounds like no matter so what, So you really have to be educated as all. That's, that's yeah. the only time I have an issue is when people get, try to get too involved and, and just please go educate yourself. There are ad courses you can take. There's, you you know so many if you want to go if you look cool go take classes you know mm-hmm. go think go find out what you're protesting against exactly I, and i think that goes both ways like making sure that if you're a vegan make sure you know what yeah. the agricultural business is about where your food is coming from because because uh, because even vegans have to be, have, do rely on agriculture for their food they do always <laughs> rely on agriculture you need to know where your food is coming from no matter who you are what you believe or where you come from and if you're a person who consumes meat, you should know where that meat is coming from. You should know mm-hmm. something about the animal that you're eating, whether you're for animal rights or not or whatever, or however you feel about it. You should actually know where your food is coming from and how it affects your environment and the world around mm-hmm. you, which is it's something that I encourage people to do no matter mm-hmm. what. And going from that, I actually... I, I wanted to ask you. This is a stupid question. <laughs> how do you? We how, love those. There's no such thing. <laughs> how do you feel about your best friend being vegan? <laughs> I, you know, I joke <laughs> every now and then, but I actually do respect your choice. I do know that in your case, it is health based. Mm-hmm. In some ways, if you ever 
when they eat meat again, I definitely would be, find it easier to cook for you. Because <laughs> I love cooking for people. Yeah. So when you come over, now I'm like looking in my kitchen, I'm like, what can I make you that's vegan? Because I just got used to you being a vegetarian and cooking for you that way. But, well, it got really easy. But and I, you were, you were I can't really make you my pancakes it. anymore. But you know what? The swap to make it vegan is so easy. I can easy. make a swap. Yeah. I'm just, and, and that's the thing. I could, but I'm just saying, I'm like, I don't know if I don't have vegan recipes. But it's not a big deal. And that's your life and I'm not going to stand here and be like I disagree with you like please don't go out and like steal a calf or something or like you know go protesting or whatever I really do highly encourage people to like go get an education with these things because it's like with any company so many people don't even understand you know why certain policies are in place for retail it's like they're in place for a reason something happened that warranted it to be a permanent thing Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said, I'm not going to be upset over people not eating meat and not eating certain, you know, animal byproducts. Mm-hmm. It does, I think, long term hurt the industry. And so that's a lot of animals being slaughtered down the road because yeah, there's no market of, for it. Or or lack or, of production. Like people will just stop producing more milk cows or beef cows because the demand is low. Yeah, you have that initial stopping I mean, point where, yeah, you're definitely hurting like all these, you know, families involved in these businesses. But, but, we, but we never would really know the actual impact of it down the road. Uh, it's been over 10 years since the dairy industry started declining. And I honestly never would have saw what was happening now coming. Yeah. So you just, so you just never know. I think everybody kind of, I'm not going to say that you're wrong because mm-hmm. you could be absolutely right, but I'm only going to say we would just not know. I guess we'll just it, have it, to see. It, it, it would be such a risk. It's like if tomorrow we made a whole thing where everybody has to go vegan, which I actually disagree with. Cause again, I don't, agree with people forcing people to change their lives yeah i believe in forcing anybody to do anything but hypothetically if that went into effect and everything changed yes there'd probably be mass slaughter yes there might be an adjustment but where would that end and what would it do and how would our world be affected we wouldn't know for sure and so for this time being i'm just in support of people living their lives the way they want to live them as long as you're not hurting anybody else and um what you want Mm-hmm. The animals are taken care of. <laughs> I mean, even the ones that are raised for slaughter, I can be totally honest when I say the people that are raising those animals love them. And they do. But they understand that they're feeding a lot of people. And that's, you know, people who are choosing to eat meat. And we would definitely all. have to re innovate the way that we do things. And I think that's just a part of you know going into the future and advancing it's coming up with new ways to to do things you know sustainably because we know better now and i, I think yeah, that's, that's but the there's also point. but that, but there's also those that are like some things are fine and there's definitely people like i know that if we're going into beef production there are people who raise beef they are they definitely absolutely bring in new methods they absolutely educate themselves on more sustainability they we all love the earth. <laughs> that's the thing I think that's hard for some people to believe is I think there's such a hero versus villain thing when it comes to certain people's point of view about people eating meat or not eating meat. And nobody is the hero. Nobody's the villain. Everybody sees a different way of doing things. It's the balance that I think makes things work out properly. You may be completely one side, but respect that somebody might be completely the other side, but that the, for the two of you being in the world are making it better. Because you're pushing an industry forward with each other's views. No, oh, I, I like that concept, and it's definitely true. It's the people that drive the change mm-hmm. for the future, for the change for all these different industries, and we definitely need both sides or all sides definitely. to come together and bounce off ideas, you know, from each, off of each other and learn from each other in order to grow. Yeah. And that being said, back to agriculture, like definitely do educate yourself. A lot of people are saying, I've been on these websites. I've talked to this people. Please go talk to farmers. There are so many people. There's such a, so many farmers feel so personally attacked right now. And and they are actually personally attacked right now in some ways. And, but I've seen so many people even on, and you know, you see people on the internet, even that are like, please come talk to farmers. Please come talk to us. We will love to just like, let you know how the industry works on our side like just please understand how things are working right now afterwards you may disagree or you may not but please just educate yourself from a perspective of somebody who spent their entire lives educating themselves on this industry 
and on and on what you need to take good care of the land, to take good care of the animals. And on that note, I really want to thank you for sharing your your side of things and your background in this industry and the fact that we should be asking more questions and figuring out what our beliefs are and how they affect others and what we should be doing in order to learn and educate ourselves more on all these different topics. So thank you again for, for being on this podcast. Anytime. For, for a second time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. Yes. After my conversation with Jenna, I stumbled across a report published in the British medical journal, The Lancet, that claims to have devised a diet plan that can feed 10 billion people by 2050. It recommends a largely plant-based diet with small occasional allowances for meat, dairy, and sugar. The report was compiled by a group of 30 scientists from around the world who study nutrition or food policy. For three years, they deliberated with the intent of creating recommendations that could be adopted by governments to meet the challenge of feeding a growing world population. A summary of the report states even small increases in the consumption of red meat or dairy foods would make this goal difficult or impossible to achieve. World Resources Institute and other environmental groups have sounded a call to action to cut our impact on the environment in half by eating less meat and dairy. According to a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the results pointed to a higher ratio of animal to plant protein in diet and higher meat intake were associated with an increased mortality risk. Higher total protein intake appeared to be associated with mortality mainly among those with predisposing disease. Then there's the question of morality. One of my favorite quotes is actually a question. It says, the only thing vegetarianism asks us philosophically is, are you okay that something died? The question creates an opportunity to think about the decisions you are making and how it affects the lives of others around you. Are you also contributing to the fact that this being has died? Although Americans still eat four times as much meat as the rest of the world, the demand for plant-based foods soared 20% last year, compared with 8% in 2017. No matter what their reasons, people are choosing the path of less meat and dairy. But I don't want this podcast to force anyone into making a decision right now, one way or the other. What I do want you to do is keep thinking globally and acting locally and let that guide you.